This is a production from the Takedown Sports. What's up, y'all? C. Brown 31 here, along with Jay Bot the Great. This is another episode of The Last Word. So today, we have three big topics for y'all. We'll be hitting the news of Tim T. will possibly signing with the Jacksonville Jaguars, the NFL releasing his 2021 schedule, and wrapping up the NBA season, gearing up for the playoffs. Yeah, so Tim Tebow, former NFL QB who last played with the Eagles in the preseason and had his last regular season game with the Jets in 2012, is very likely to sign as a tight end with the Jaguars soon. Uh, nothing is confirmed yet, but things are very heavily trending in that direction. He's worked out with the Jaguars as a tight end, and uh, they seem, according to some reports, very likely to sign him. And it's it's quite a controversial move. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on it? I, I really... So when I first saw the news initially that he was possibly going to try to be a tight end, I was like, all right, this is a... Uh, you know, end of show kind of thing that they just throw in. It's just some random stuff. He's not actually going to sign or anything, right? And then a few days later, you see, oh, yeah, he's, he's going to be brought in with the Jacksonville Jaguars to be a tight end. This is complete nonsense. <laughs> Look, I don't have nothing against Tim Tebow as a person or anything like that. I mean, he's a good dude and all that. But um, how is this man getting a job in the NFL today, except for the fact that the man – he won a national championship for it back at Florida. He's now the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars, and he seems like he's kind of the GM too, um, you know, because he's doing all this player personnel, you know, staff thing. Obviously, that makes sense since he's a coach, and you know, he's one to have guys that he knows surrounding him. But I hope Urban Meyer doesn't think this is some kind of you know college situation where you can just bring all your friends around him. <laughs> Bring in whoever you want, because Tim Tebow has no business playing a tight end at this point in his career. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just like you said, it's it's foolishness. Like this guy, this man played QB, uh, like you know, uh, uh, almost a decade ago, and now he's coming back as as a completely different position after that much time off, and you know, he's going to be playing for a rookie quarterback. And of course, this is old coach that he won the championship with, like you said, and that's what I think this is. This is kind of like. Urban Meyer being like, yeah, this is a great idea. This will be fun bringing all the guys together. But the goal here is not to bring all the guys together. You want to win a championship. And I don't think bringing, you know, a, a retired quarterback in as a tight end is a great way to push your team over the edge for a championship. And I mean, you know, the Jags drafted fine. You know, they, they got some good pieces, especially, you know, they got, they were able to get Trevor Lawrence. But is, is Tim Tebow really the guy you want to, to give to Lawrence as his, his tight end? his first year in, in the NFL? I think the answer for, for most people would be no. Yeah, so I see a few different scenarios here. Um, one, Urban Meyer doesn't really care about this signing. Uh, I think he, in that sense, he probably isn't taking it super seriously. Like, you know, maybe it's just kind of a whatever thing. Uh, I would hope not. I would hope you would take your job seriously. And, I mean, <laughs> this man's won multiple championships at the college level, so I assume he takes his job seriously. Um, the more likely scenario, I think, here, he wants to do a guy that, like I said, won him a championship of favor. You know, he wants to take a little bit of heat off of Trevor Lawrence because there's barely been any talk about Trevor since, you know, really since he got drafted. Um, even before that, there wasn't a whole lot of talk just because we knew he was going to be number one. So I guess that'll take a little bit of heat off of Trevor and be a little bit more of a distraction. Um, what I think will end up happening is Tim T will probably play less of a tight end position, more of just kind of a gadget Taysom Hill position, if that's what you want to call it nowadays. <laughs> um, yeah, that That's really the only use I see for him. But even then, I think it's still – Still kind of ridiculous that a man that has not played a regular season game since 2012 can just waltz right back in. Now, again, he hasn't officially made the team or anything like that. He might not even make it. Um, but 
I overall I think it's just kind of a little ridiculous. Yeah, I don't want to sound like we're overreacting or anything, or like that I'm overreacting. But I think even the fact that he's kind of been given this chance to just pop back in in a completely new position and a, in a brand new environment, just with his old coach, is is kind of ridiculous. Like in itself, like even if he isn't signed, the fact that it was just considered for him to come back after 2012 as a brand new position and, and play again is kind of disrespectful to some other guys and. You know, I think uh, I've seen some 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 defensive players and stuff around the league say like, "Oh, we're we're gonna eat him up if, when we play him," and that's also not great for Urban Meyer's plan. Like, I I I think it's a good idea to take some of the heat off of Trevor Lawrence. Not having media pressure on you allows you to you know play a little smoother and a little less nervous. But you also don't want uh, your your tight end or your Taysom Hill inspector gadget like man to. <laughs> to get demolished by defenses simply because he's he's playing on a team. And that might not be fair to him, but it, it definitely it's definitely a possibility that some of these guys are not gonna like this the signing and they're gonna go after him. And I mean, if he's an offensive player coming out a defensive player, they have every right to, you know, tackle him within the, the boundaries of the game. Obviously don't target him or, you know, try to eradicate the man from existence. But it it, it could it could lead to some rough situations for the Jaguars that Urban Meyer may not have have uh, expected to come out of it, which also may affect his signing because, like, like we said, he's not signed yet, and so this this backlash may even push Urban Meyer in the opposite direction. So we were yet to see. That's true, but I, Urban doesn't really strike me as the type of guy that's really going to care. I mean, the fact that they're even doing this in the first place, you know, I, <laughs> it shows that they don't really care. Um, the the point that you made about Defensive players come out and saying, "Yo, we're gonna kill this dude." Not literally, of course, but you know, they're gonna clock. Him. You know, as you said, if he's an offensive player and he has a ball in his hands, <laughs> I mean, that's that's just a thing. Now, I don't think there's a perception among players. There shouldn't be a perception among players that they are just absolutely disgusted by Tim Tebow being in the league. Like, it doesn't bother my soul that much. I don't think it bothers the players' souls that much. I think it's just more of an annoying thing because it's like, how how can a guy that hasn't played since 2012, as we said, he wasn't really good last time we saw him um, with the Jets. And then he did play in a preseason with the Eagles in 2015, as mentioned earlier. But last time we saw him, he wasn't really good. You, It's just you can't take that much of a layoff from football. I mean, if you think about the guys that have taken breaks and come back to sports. Michael Jordan is one of the greatest players to ever <laughs> step foot on a basketball court. Many people say he's the greatest. That's sure, you know, if you want to argue that, go ahead. But Michael Jordan is one of the greatest players. And he took like two years off and then came back. And he was fine. This man, Tebow, was not even close to one of the greatest players to ever play NFL football. Obviously, college football, he's one of the top players, period, considering his popularity, the fact that he won the Heisman, uh, SEC player of the year, et cetera, et cetera. But NFL level, he, he wasn't that impressive. Like, yes, he did take the team going from one and four to eight and eight, winning that division title, winning that playoff game against the Steelers in overtime. That was great. But as far as his NFL career, pretty much lackluster. So a guy like him coming back after such a long layoff, it's not even going to be clear, like not even close to the same, excuse me. So I just don't understand it. Like, like I said, I think it's more of a just thing where he's going to come in, he'll play like that Taysom Hill role, maybe special teams. Um, I don't expect to see Tebow blocking a lot because Tim Tebow is pretty decently big. Especially for a guy that did play quarterback for his whole career. But I don't think he's going to be trying to block any defenders coming off the edge or anything like that. It's just not plausible to me. So, I don't know. I'm not rooting against him. I mean, if he doesn't make the team, then I guess it'll be interesting to see. But I just think it's just stupid, period. Yeah, I mean, I'd definitely be excited to see what he does if he does make the team. I mean, it's, it'll be interesting to see him playing a tight end position and you know, we'll see how he works out with everything. And uh, you mentioned, like, blocking. That's another one of, you know, a tight end's responsibilities sometimes. And I think that that also opens up more opportunities for defenders to try to nail you. 
you know, if you're going to try to block a guy and he can overpower you and, and get to the quarterback, then that's, that's his job. And, you know, I think as built as Tebow is, he's, he, he's used to trying to, you know, evade the sack, not just ram into the guy and hold, hold him off. So, you know, maybe he's been doing some training, maybe he will make the team and he'll be entertaining to watch, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how things go. I think it's quite the weird situation. Um, Weird decision in general to, to even consider it, but could lead to, to some interesting football. So why not? I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of the biggest thing about it. It was like Tim Tebow coming back to football, probably one of the biggest stories in the NFL this year, and it's not even close. Um, like I said, he didn't have much NFL success. He won that one playoff game, but Tim Tebow was a superstar before he even got drafted. Um, yeah. we, we, he went from college to the NFL to baseball, now back to the NFL. This guy's been a superstar pretty much everywhere. Uh, I, it's just something about Tebow, I guess. I don't know. Um, I, I started watching football around the time that he won the Heisman. So I, I understand it, but it's just something about Tebow, I guess. It's just kind of just insanely popular and that makes people just want to see what he does, no matter what he does. So. It's going to bring eyes to the NFL, and at the end of the day, I guess that's what it's about anyway. I mean, from Urban Meyer's perspective, I don't think he needs eyes. He needs a ring. <laughs> but I, you, you still make a good point. You know, you need eyes to come to the NFL. You need the ratings. You need the money. And uh, Tim Tebow, like you said, has always been a superstar. You put his name on a on a game, like, hey, Tim Tebow and the Jags face off against so-and-so, which obviously they should never say that. It should be Trevor Lawrence and the Jags if they promote anything. But – you know, just mentioning Tim Tebow or knowing he's there and like, oh, we're good to see Tebow play again. A lot of people are going to be super excited to see that. And it's a, it's a good business move, if not a good football move. Yeah, you mentioned the Jaguars um, and Urban Meyer specifically, you know, they need a ring. <laughs> Obviously, that's the goal of every coach in the NFL, every player. But the Jaguars ain't getting a ring no time soon. And you can quote <laughs> me on that. But that is something that I've thought about is because – we can sit here and talk about this is a bad move, this is a good move, et cetera, et cetera. But we ain't actually playing. When you consider the guys that are in the locker room and they have to practice with this guy every day, they have to see him every day, um, then it kind of thinks like, hey, does Urban Meyer, our coach, supposed to have our best interest in mind? Does he really? Does he know what he's doing? Um, and locker room chemistry is incredibly important in sports and you can't say otherwise. So... Like I say, I don't think it hurts these players' souls or anything, but I think it kind of just – I would be a little bit off-put and like, okay, why are, you, why are you messing around trying to sign Tim Tebow? Like it's – there's this idea that a lot of the players are going to automatically look up to Tebow. Eh, I don't really feel that. Like I understand, like I said, Tebow was an icon in football, but there are dudes that are 10 years younger than Tebow that have played the same amount of NFL games that he has. <laughs> so in that sense, I mean, it's I don't think Tebow's going to come in and just be like this locker room leader or something like that. I, I just don't see that at all. Yeah, to your point here, I think that's a great, great uh, thing. Like, So you bring this guy in and, and you're going to have your team kind of question, like, all right, does Coach really have what's best for us in mind here when he brings this, this old quarterback in as our new tight end? And then – you know, being a, a role model, sure, he might have, like, you know, the old, I'm an old superstar kind of, like, you know, I, I that, that kind of presence, which helps a little bit, but it, it definitely doesn't add into role modeling. And then as far as being a role model, Trevor Lawrence, they might have both been college icons, right? But as you mentioned, Tim Tebow did not do very well in the NFL, and that is not the kind of career you want to um, put yourself in the path on if you're, if you're Trevor Lawrence, right? Because you've already got the college superstardom down. And if you want to be an NFL superstar, that's great. But if you want to be, you know, Tebow level superstar, you should maybe pick someone else for your level of success. And I don't think that's, you know, the best guy to take to Trump, as, at least at the NFL level. And that's really no slight to Tebow. I mean, it, it kind of is, I guess. But, but I just, I'm not sure he's going to be the best locker room presence or even the best, you know, kind of veteran build up role model. Something like Jimmy Garoppolo might, might be. To Trey Lance, you know, he's not going to be able to guide this guy uh, as great as, as what they think he can because he himself didn't really get anywhere in the NFL. 
Yeah, once again, none of this is at Tim Tebow as a person. We're just strictly talking football here. Um, like I said, Tim Tebow is a good dude, but I, I just don't see it. Like, what, what is the point? You know, I, like, it's not like this dude is 27 years old or something, right? <laughs> He's going to turn 34 by the time the season starts or during the season. It, it's just, it just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, but. If the players don't in the locker room themselves don't really have much of a problem with it, if Trevor Lawrence doesn't have a problem with it, I've heard people in the organization have had problems with it, which I'm not surprised. But if they get over it, then I guess you really can't say much. I mean, what are you going to do? You can't like just beat up Tim and then kick him out of the team, right? <laughs> so, you know, it, I don't. It's not like I'm going to I'm going to think that Tim Tebow is going to cause any problems in the locker room. He's not like as a person. But maybe his presence will. But I don't. I don't know. Considering the fact that Jaguars don't have that many veterans and that many guys that have been on winning teams in the first place, maybe they can kind of put Tebow in a position where he's like, you know, maybe even though I'm not a guy that has won a whole lot in the NFL, obviously and hasn't had much of a career, I can at least give you some advice. Just being a 33, 34 year old man, so. Maybe in that sense, okay, I get that as a person, but football-wise, nah. All right, y'all. So on Thursday, we had the 2021 NFL schedule release. Um, Obviously, this year, it's a little bit different because we have an extra week of games. We're going from 16 to 17, so obviously 17 weeks to 18 weeks. So I'm all for the extra football. And that begins with the Dallas Cowboys taking on the defending Super Bowl champs, the Buccaneers. Opening so Thursday. Of course, this is going to make a fun social media matchup once the game's over, even during the game. Got the Tom Brady fans versus the Dallas fans. But as far as the actual game goes, this will probably be a Tampa Bay whooping as far as, that means, you know, Tampa Bay beating down Dallas. Um, now, last year when the when the season opened, uh, the Bucks got steamrolled by the Saints. So maybe the Dallas Cowboys will come out with the fire under them and catch the Bucks by surprise. But the Bucks have played for the whole season. A whole season together they've won a chip together i don't expect them to get shocked by dallas in week one yeah i don't either i mean dallas is getting dak prescott back but i don't think that really makes much of a difference against the super bowl champs and then another matchup that uh is a, is a pretty big one for me for week one is going to be green bay versus new orleans assuming that you know green bay is normal green bay and has aaron Rodgers at the helm because i mean that's always a great match you've, you've got green bay Aaron Rodgers firing against the used to be Drew Brees helmed Saints, but now the Saints are going to be a little bit of a new look this season. And so, you know, usually Green Bay versus the Saints in recent years has kind of ended in a Saints loss. We'll probably do the same thing unless uh, Green Bay ends up without Rodgers, and then we could have a, you know, new quarterback battle. Yeah, to think that in one year we've gone from Drew Brees versus Aaron Rodgers to Jameis or Taysom Hill against Jordan Love, possibly. <laughs> so then we move on to week two, and I, I see one of the biggest matchups already will be Buffalo versus Miami. Uh, two young powerhouse teams. They're both coming off of fiery seasons last season. Buffalo a little more successful than Miami, of course. And uh, this would probably used to be a, a division rivalry game that wouldn't amount to much, but now it should actually be a very entertaining match. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the Bills made it to the AFC Championship game last year. They did lose to Kansas City, but I think they'll be back better than ever. And then, obviously, too, with the Dolphins, he's got some more weapons to work with, so I think it'll be a pretty good game. As far as what I would say is the game of the week, pretty obvious here. The Chiefs at the Baltimore Ravens. You got Lamar MVP versus Pat, (laughs) my homeboys, so, you know, that will be a pretty good game. I'm glad they put that at night. Um, of course, we'll probably end up having to watch Dallas at 4.30 as usual. But I will say Kansas City and Baltimore would be a pretty great game to watch. I, I have to agree. I mean, those are two – I mean, they're, they're, those are like the two big gun shows for the AFC right now. And you, you can't really go wrong putting them against each other. It's, it's, it's just super fun to watch every time. So, yep. as we slide over to week three – any of those matches stick out as your, your game of the week? So to me, I would say Tampa Bay going up against L.A. Um, both of these teams have incredible offenses. Uh, Matthew Stafford is now in L.A. 
So I think they'll even they'll be even better than they were last year. Obviously, you mentioned earlier Tampa Bay is Super Bowl defending champions. So yeah, I mean, I think it'll be a pretty great offensive game. I think Tampa Bay will win at the end, but it will be a good game to watch. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's just going to be another shootout, you know, two super offenses going against each other. That's always fun to watch uh, in, in, in almost any situation. I'm going to go with a, a sleeper pick here, and since this is week three, and I'm going to pick Chicago at Cleveland and hope and assume that that's going to be a Justin Fields, Baker Mayfield showdown, and that should be fun to watch. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure if Justin's going to be starting by then. I guess it kind of just depends on how things shape up in the offseason. Uh, if they like him in practice and they want to just put him out there straight up, then you know, go ahead. But, yeah, if, if Justin Fields starts, I think it'll be a good game for yeah, sure. I don't have as much faith in Andy Dalton to make it to week three, but I'm also not you know a coach or anything like that. So we'll, we'll see how things actually pan out. Yep. So now moving into week four, I would say the game that I'm looking at right now is Seattle going up against the 49ers. The 49ers should be at full strength. Uh, as hopefully they don't have any injuries like they did last year. Um, Seattle, they're going to be coming back. Uh, they definitely had to improve in the offseason because after their collapse last year, um, we may see Trey Lance. But I doubt it, <laughs> but either way, it'll be a good game. Yeah, I mean, seeing Trey Lance would be fun, but I think even with, with Jimmy G at the helm, that's going to be a fun one to watch no matter what. You know, once again, you've got two super good teams that have made it to some pretty high levels recently, and they'll, they'll definitely be battling it out. Now, I, you know, won't mind watching a Carolina-Dallas game this year. It, it, those are usually pretty fun games, but I don't think we can ignore the Tampa Bay-New England game as Brady makes his return to New England. It may not be the best game, but it'll definitely be a big yep. show. Yeah, that's one that's circled on Tom Brady's calendar, I know for <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, I, I don't think he has beef with Bill, but obviously <laughs> he left for a reason. So him going back to Foxborough, uh, to the place where he won six titles and he had all that success. It's 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 going to be a spectacle as far as the build up the game. I'm not really sure. I, I hope Cam does well if he's still the starting quarterback at that point, which I think he will be. But um, I, I don't think New England will beat Tampa Bay. Yeah, I'm not not counting on it. it. Would be fun to see and and given the situation, but definitely would be a tough feat for for New England to accomplish. Now. As we get into week five, I think, honestly, the Thursday night game is going to be probably my favorite game of that week as we get the Rams versus Seattle. Once again, for the same reasons these two teams have been mentioned before, you know, just super, super powerhouse teams that are, are going to really put on a light show. And it being a Thursday night game means, you know, we definitely get to see it and, and no matter where you're at. And that's always great. Yeah, I mean, the NFL, they know better than anybody else. They need to put their best games on national TV. Uh, everybody's going to get this Thursday night game since it's on Fox as well as NFL Network and Amazon apparently now too. But yeah, like you said, I mean, we're going to have Russ maybe going for an MVP again. <laughs> going to against Matthew Stafford and that high power Rams offense. As for my pick of game of the week though, I would say it's the Sunday night game, which would be the Bills at Kansas City. It would be a rematch of the AFC Championship game. And it's possible that the Bills might get the win this time around. Yeah, actually, that is a really good pick for game of the week. And once again, that's another you know nighttime game that everyone should be able to see. And uh, that's going to be a revenge game for Buffalo for sure. And Buffalo could come out with the edge on that one, especially having that extra motivation of getting not only the loss, but just getting pushed out of the season. Uh, that, that makes you come back with a vengeance. So sliding into week six, what are some matches that you think would be most interesting. This one may not be the most, you know, fireworks shootout game, but I'm going to go with Miami versus Jacksonville because you get uh, Tua versus Trevor Lawrence. And I think that one will be very entertaining to watch these two young guys go at it and really get a chance to, to prove themselves against it themselves. Now, I think Miami will take an easy win over Jacksonville because of Jacksonville's, you know, defensive issues. But getting to see Trevor Lawrence and Tua go at it and on the professional level will be will be great. You know, maybe Jacksonville will do a lot better in this game since it's their annual London game. They might want to show out for the UK fans over there. <laughs> yeah, they. For me though, I'd say two matchups that. I go was ahead. Say, yeah, they they def they get to go to London a lot more than anyone else to see them. So maybe that'll be where they put on a big show for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I I'd say two matches for me, 
would be the Cowboys and Patriots because obviously the Patriots are still a top brand in the NFL. And then you have the Cowboys, of course. And then the Seahawks had the Steelers. Uh, um, Steelers collapsed even worse than the Seahawks <laughs> last year. I mean, the Steelers were undefeated through 11 games, and then they just completely died at the end of the season and in the playoffs. So maybe this will be Big Ben's last season. I think it is. So we might see how he goes out. Yeah, I mean, he, we'll see what happens. And this this is definitely a big game to have in a final season. You know, you come up against such a such a powerful team that you you – you know, see in other situations sometimes. And like it, like you said, it could be Big Ben's last season, and that would be kind of sad to see. But at the same time, you know, he's he's getting up there. So give him a few few big games, and maybe he won't collapse as bad this year. I, I hope not. That that was a terrible thing to witness. But also, it was it was entertaining. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. And then we, as we move into week seven, I think one of the big matchups for me is going to be Kansas City versus Tennessee. Now, of course, you know, Tennessee might not be seen as quite the powerhouse Kansas City is, and, and truthfully, they're they're not quite up at that level. But they always make for a good game. They fight it out, and I think they'll definitely put up a, a good battle to make this be a, a good competitive game for, for defensive reasons as well as offensive reasons. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Derrick Henry is probably going to go off as usual. Then you also have Patrick Mahomes and the Chief offense going crazy. So I think this will be a pretty good game. Um, the other game that I would say would be uh, notable. I, won't, I don't think it's going to be as good of a game, but it will be Chicago and Tampa Bay. We could possibly see Justin Fields in this game. If not, then I think it's going to be a Tampa Bay slaughter. <laughs> but, you know, either way, it is notable. Yeah, no no Justin Fields in that game, and this Tampa Bay is going to probably just breeze through them, and, and the Bears won't be able to put up many points at all. But uh, Justin Fields in the game, they will probably still lose, but they at least put up a little bit more of, of a fight and make the score not look as pitiful. <laughs> so moving into week eight, uh, I would say the big matchup that stands out to me would be Pittsburgh versus Cleveland. It's pretty obvious at this point, these teams do not like each other, obviously, uh, the division rivals already. So that's a thing. But especially since we've had incidents in the last few <laughs> years, the Mason Rudolph thing, you know, we, we know they buried the hatchet, but that happened. Um, and then last year in the playoffs, the Browns <laughs> completely marked the Steelers. And it seems like the Steelers kind of got what they deserved, you know, because they, they were running their mouths a whole lot. So it was nice to see Cleveland beat them. And, you know, Cleveland's upgraded in the offseason for sure. So we might see it happen again. Yeah, I mean, we know what Juju said. The Browns is the Browns. So maybe the Browns will come in and be the Browns again and blow <laughs> blow Pittsburgh out the water. I think that'd be fun to see. Uh the Steelers are just too mouthy of a team for me, so I like to see them, you know, get 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 what they need. But this is always a great matchup, these two teams to go at each other with everything they have. No matter how good either one is, they, they make it look like it's two top-tier teams a lot of the time. So that's that's pretty much what I expect. For me, I'm going to go with, with Green Bay versus Arizona on Thursday night. Uh, Arizona's got some new pieces of defense. They, they've, they've been upgrading their offense. And I think this will be a, a pretty underrated high-powered matchup. I mean, these two teams are, are pretty top-tier teams. That's just Arizona's a little more slept on, and I think that it'll be a, a very impressive game. Yeah, I mean, I think year three is really when Kyler Murray's going to take off. You know, I, I'm not saying he's going to be the MVP, but he could be an MVP candidate for sure. Um, and again, this is contingent on the fact that Aaron Rodgers stays in the Bay. So, you know, nah. maybe, with, maybe With not. Aaron Rodgers not there, I, I, I'd pick a different matchup for that week. <laughs> Yeah. So, moving into week nine, uh, I think for me, I'll say New England and, and Carolina. Uh, our Panthers will will get to possibly welcome Cam back in this time as an opponent, and it's technically a revenge game for Cam. And hopefully, we we are the ones who come out on top. As much as I love Cam Newton, you know, I like the Panthers as a team a little more than just one one of our old players, and I do not want him to come in and stomp us. So, I'd like to see us win that game, and I think. Our talent levels are fairly similar this year, and it should be a very close game. Yeah, I agree there. If we win by, you know, two points and Cam throws for 400 yards, I'd be satisfied there. You know, we eke out a small win against the Patriots, and, you know, Cam still looks like Cam, so that's a win-win. A matchup for me would be kind of obvious here, uh, Green Bay versus the Kansas City Chiefs. You pretty much got... 
Aaron Rodgers, the prototype of what <laughs> Patrick Mahomes <laughs> is now. So you know, you got that matchup there. Uh, these guys won two of the last three MVPs. Uh, these teams are high powered offenses. Uh, Kansas City definitely has a lot better of a defense for sure. Uh, <laughs> Green Bay didn't improve in the offseason, but still. But this is definitely going to be a great game. Yeah, I mean, once again, you got these two super offenses coming at each other, contingent on you know Aaron Rodgers being in Green Bay, and you know two two previous MVPs coming at each other, two very recent MVPs at that, and it's it, it, you can call it the State Farm game as well if you want to, <laughs> but it it should be a a very fun game. Yep. So that'll be it for us going through the schedule. Um, we only wanted to do about half of the schedule because. Going through all 18 weeks would take about an hour, you know, <laughs> if we wanted to analyze every single matchup. So, like with the draft, we only did about half of the first round. So, here we're doing half of the schedule. Um, and, heck, once we get to about week nine anyway, there can be a lot of different things going on because teams always show up. So, there we go. Yeah, about our, our most accurate thing we can do is – as. As this far from, from the season, because, you know, like you said, things will change. Certain teams will show up, certain teams won't show up. And after about week nine, some of our predictions may not hold up anymore at all just because of how things have changed. Yep. So for our third and final segment today, we kind of want to discuss the end of the NBA season, getting real close. We only have two days worth of games left as we're recording on Friday night. Um, and then the play-in will be pretty soon after that and the playoffs will start so we wanted to just discuss you know standings who will be in the playing games some predictions these last few games yeah so of course Terrence mentioned we've got the play-in coming up uh, they come up short, shortly after the end of the regular season they start may 18th and right now in the eastern conference uh things are a little more locked up all of the playoff spots are are, are locked in the Sixers, Nets, Bucks, Hawks, Heat, and Knicks in that order have locked up a playoff spot. And then the Celtics, Hornets, and Pacers are certified to be in a play-in spot. And the the pretty much the Wizards and Bulls seem to be the ones battling out for uh, for, for that, that, that last play-in spot. Everyone else in the East has been eliminated. Moving to the West, things are a little more up in the air. The Jazz, Suns, Clippers, and Nuggets have hooked up a, a, a playoff spot. But then the Mavericks, Trailblazers, and Lakers are kind of going to see in these last two games who ends up locking up the two playoff spots and who ends up in the seventh seed, which puts you at the play-in spot. And then the Warriors, Grizzlies, and Spurs have those other three play-in spots, while the Pelicans, Kings, Timberwolves, and Thunder Rockets are gone. They are, they are done for the season. Not not like they have regular season games left, but we won't be really seeing any of them. Yeah, so... I want to pose a quick question here. So if everything stays the same, let's go to the Western Conference first. Okay. So if we, the standings stay the same as they are right now with the Lakers, Warriors, Grizzlies, and Spurs being in the play-in, how do you see those matches playing out? So with how the play-in tournament works, that, of course, puts the Lakers versus Warriors, which is a very exciting matchup. Now, fully healthy Lakers should take the Warriors easy as, you know, Steph and his, his merry band of, of goons here. Uh, as the Warriors are definitely not at full strength. So I would say the Lakers should take that. And then the Grizzlies and Spurs, Grizzlies might have the, the, the you know, seeding advantage, but I think the Spurs Spurs could take them, kind of surprise them a little bit. And then, you know, as the play-in tournament moves a little weird, that would in that scenario, we'd have the Spurs versus Warriors. And then it just depends on who wants it more, DeMar or Steph. And from there, I think the Warriors could take it or the Spurs could take it. it it's, it's very 50-50 if that's the matchup we get. What do you think? So if things stand now, I think the Lakers would beat the Warriors in the playing game if LeBron and AD are both there and on top of their game. Um, I don't think Steph and his band of goons will <laughs> be enough. Uh, I think the Grizzlies would beat the Spurs, but it's kind of a toss up there. Um, so let's just say this, the Grizzlies advance there. Um, they would go on to play the Warriors. I think Steph would will the Warriors to win, and then it'll pretty much end up like it is now. Lakers at seven, Warriors at eight, and in that situation there, um, the Warriors would be going up against the Jazz in the first round. The Lakers would be going up against the Suns if things stay the same way. 
Um, <laughs> in that case, I don't see the Warriors beating the Jazz, but the Lakers could very well beat the Suns at full strength for sure. Yeah, so with both of our scenarios, you have the Warriors at eight. Mine would be the Spurs are at eight. Um, the Spurs nor the Warriors are beating the Jazz in a seven-game series. So let's, let's just – that that kind of fizzles out and it makes that little tournament kind of pointless. But the Lakers against the Suns, the Lakers have a huge chance to take the Suns. You know, you don't want to look at that as your regular two versus seven matchup. You, you've got the seven seed should be the, the uh, top three seed. And, and I, I think the Suns will be in trouble if the Lakers manage to – climb out of the play-in tournament and, and end up having to go up against them. So that would suck for the Suns, but be a great scenario for the Lakers who I think know that they could take the Suns. Yeah. Now, with that being said, we could see some movement and the Lakers might not even end up playing in the play-in in the first place. We could see the Mavericks down there um, or the Trailblazers. Um, the Lakers do play on Saturday. And then we have... The Grizzlies and Warriors actually playing on Sunday. So we could definitely see some movement there. The Mavericks also do play on Sunday. Um, so, you know, anything can really happen to end this season here. So we, we may see a scenario where the Lakers end up being the sixth seed and we have Dame and the Trailblazers going up against the Warriors. So <laughs> that might be an interesting matchup there. Yeah, honestly, in my opinion, if the Mavericks or, or Trailblazers end up in that playing spot and they end up doing the same thing the Lakers do where they still keep the seventh seed, they can't face the Suns in a seven-game series. So they're safer by staying where they're at and not having to go through that play-in gauntlet. I, at least in my opinion, I don't think they can hold up against the Suns as well as the Lakers can. Like I said, the Lakers should be a top three seed. And so them getting to that play-in and, and tournament is a little sneaky, you know, to get to face off against somebody like that. Uh, at a, as a quote-unquote upset, whereas the Mavericks and Trailblazers would actually be needing to pull off a big upset to, to beat the Suns. Yeah, on the flip side of that, the Lakers being the sixth seed, that would put them up against the Clippers, more likely than <laughs> not, at the three seed. And this is the matchup that everybody was expecting in the Western Conference Final last year. Um, obviously, the Clippers didn't hold up their end of the bargain there. <laughs> But now it's kind of an interesting scenario. We have the Clippers at three and then the Lakers down at six. But again, if the Lakers are at full strength, then, you know, this matchup can go either way. Yeah, I mean, I don't trust the Clippers in a playoff situation. So I'd say if the Battle of L.A. was to happen in the first round, that the Clippers are going home. But they could surprise me. You know, Kawhi could come out on fire. Um, playoff Paul could be actual playoff Paul and, and not pandemic Paul. Um so we'll just have to see how that goes. I would give the edge to the Lakers against the Clippers in a seven-game series, but I think the Clippers shouldn't really be underestimated. I mean, they're they're still the Clippers. They're a great team. You've got to come at them with everything you've got. You you can't you know let them slip against you. But they have to keep that mindset too, because they kind of let the Nuggets you know oh we got them on a three-one, and then that that didn't work too well for them. So uh, just got to not put themselves in that kind of position again. Yep. So. Moving over to the Eastern Conference with how those things look. Now, the playing tournaments are pretty much set. The only thing is going to be who gets that 10th seed. So as things are now, what are your predictions as, as what the final playoff implications will be? Yeah, so I don't see the Wizards losing that 10th spot. Uh, Westbrook and Beal um, have willed that team to the 10th spot. <laughs> um, now, they would face off against the Pacers. That one, you know. Neither of those teams really deserve to be anywhere near the playoffs. <laughs> uh, but, you know, either way, that matchup can go either way, like I said. Um, and then the Celtics and the Hornets, that is an interesting matchup. The Celtics have definitely underachieved by, by a big margin this year. <laughs> um, Jalen Brown is now out too, so that's a minus there. But I don't think any of these four teams – Whoever makes it to the seven or eight spot, they're not winning in the first rounds against either the 76ers, the Nets, or the Bucks. So it doesn't really matter either way. Yeah, I was going to say, as it stands, you know, whoever makes that the seven, they see is going to end up playing either the Sixers, Nets, or Bucks. And none of those guys are going to make it against it. But just to give kind of what my rundown I think would be, I'm going to assume that the Wizards make it for the 10th spot. I think the Hornets will beat the Celtics because the Celtics have already underperformed and they lost Jalen Brown, who's been kind of their MVP for this season. And the Hornets have LaMelo back. They have Devontae Graham back as well. 
So they're, they'll probably take that one. Pacers and Wizards could go either way. Uh, I think Westbrook will probably catch fire and come out of that. But in, in the end, you know, once the Hornets have to go up against, like, the Sixers or once they have to go up against the Nets or the Wizards go up against the Sixers or Nets or Bucks, if the Bucks end up making it to two, they're not getting through that. And so while this one is more locked up over here already, there's no inner movement w- between who might lock up a playoff spot. Uh, it, it is also more locked in of who's who's getting out of the first round because the lower Eastern teams, while, while flashy and fun to watch, such as, you know, the Hornets and Wizards, they're not going to be beating the Nets, Sixers, Bucks, really not even the Hawks, Heat, or Knicks. I don't see it see it happening. Yeah, I mean, let's say the Hornets get that seven seed and the Nets stay where they are, and the Nets decide to bring out the big three sweet. in the first <laughs> round. It, it's sweet. <laughs> like, they're done. It's not even going to be a competition in that sense. Um, no no knock against the Hornets, but come on. Uh, yeah. you got three, you got three guys that are in the top ten in the NBA. Um, so it's just not going to be close. We got to stop fooling around too. Uh, James Harden is, is a good defender, especially against other guards. Uh, and he even was, was pretty good de- defending against Giannis in some games. And Giannis is, you know, has a, a lot of physical advantages over him. So, you know, putting the, like a uh, LaMelo ball and Devonte Graham and Terry Rozier up against people like Harden or KD and stuff. It's, it's stop it. <laughs> They're getting swept. Yeah, and then the other matchup, let's say the Pacers, they get that eight seed and they go up against the Sixers, that's going to be out of there too. So, yeah. you know, like we say, either way, it, it doesn't really matter who gets those bottom seeds. Um, <laughs> that's kind of unfortunate with the Eastern Conference, man. It's just it, it really don't even matter who gets those last seeds. You're not going to see any scenario where bottom seeds going to be one of those top teams. Yeah, I mean, like in the West, you have like – you know, some teams that are pretty much, they're at the bottom, they're not going to make it. But there's a little more of a chance in the East. It just kind of seems like these powerhouse teams like the Sixers, Nets, and Bucks, they're just like titans to people like the the this current year's Celtics, Hornets, and, and Pacers. So it's just just kind of sad to see these these teams are going to go through a lot of work in the play-in tournament and probably get bounced and by and it just gets swept, not even like a, you know, a rough battle out bounce, just, just no chance. So... Especially if the Celtics do happen to win that playing game and then have to face these other bigger teams without Jalen Brown, they're gone. <laughs> yeah. So while we're still on it, what's your overall opinion of the playing term? Because I've seen a lot of people really love it because it's forcing these teams to actually care about the end of the regular season here. They can't just phone it in. Um, and I see a lot of people don't like it because it's unnecessary or they think that these – Teams that are like nine or ten seed, they shouldn't even get the opportunity to be in the playoffs in the first place. So, what do you think? I'm gonna put myself, I guess, kind of in the middle ground. I also like it because a lot of regular season NBA they kind of just don't care about, and this gives them a little bit more of a reason to because you don't want to slip into a play-in situation and then get bounced. Because one thing we didn't discuss is that the Lakers could end up losing out of the play-in tournament and then straight up not make the playoffs. And I mean, that'd be terrible for a lot of reasons. And that's another criticism against it. Because you've got these big teams, like I'm a Bucks fan. If the Bucks this year were to have some injuries and end up falling to seven and then get bounced out of the play-in tournament because of, you know, just chemistry issues from trying to all come back from a bunch of injuries, I probably wouldn't be, be a big fan of the play-in tournament since we would have earned our playoff spot and then got it snatched. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to look at it. I think the pressure on the regular season is nice. You know, you want to have at least a decent record. But also having a nine and ten seed, like – Everyone's fighting to have a good record, right? So the 7 and 8 seed fought harder than the 9 and 10 seed, so why should they get a chance at the play-in tournament? And I, I, I get that. So it, I see it as, as almost a necessary evil, but at the same time, just straight-up unnecessary. It's just really hard to gauge. Uh, it's, it's such a weird and like new concept. It's, it's pretty difficult to form a good opinion on it. I guess after it happens, I'll, I'll, I'll see how I like how it... If, if the games are entertaining enough, you know, if it sets these teams on fire and, and gives them a big game to play, play, that'd be great. I mean, I'm down for watching essentially pseudo-playoff basketball. I'm, that's cool with me. But it's got to at least be good games to, to, to kind of rationalize in my head that, okay, this is worth it. Yeah, I kind of agree with most of what you said there. I hadn't even really thought much about the scenario where the Lakers could <laughs> just completely miss the playoffs if they lose you know, to the Warriors and then probably the Grizzlies. Um, 
it, that would be a pretty unreal scenario because I, I couldn't see that happening if LeBron's back. <laughs> you know, maybe they get caught against the Warriors, but that second game, I, I just couldn't imagine them losing. Um, the the amount of insanity that would happen in the NBA media <laughs> would be astronomical, and to say the least. So, but that is a very real scenario. You can't just sit around and think that you're gonna just cruise into the playoffs. But on the flip side, you know, like you said, these teams worked a lot harder to get to the playoffs. Uh, obviously, the Lakers wouldn't even be down at the bottom <laughs> had they had LeBron for most of the time. So it wouldn't, it just wouldn't seem right, you know, for a team like the Spurs to get in, or at least not. I wouldn't say the Spurs because at least they're decent as far as record wise, you know, in comparison to the, the Wizards and the Bulls, but. <laughs> Still, it, should, it, it does seem a little weird there. Um, I don't think it should continue after this season. I think it was okay for the bubble um, and then for this season because it's, it's a COVID-shortened season. But after this, just go back to playing regular basketball. If you want to change the playoff format, then you can just do the top 16 teams like a lot of people have wanted. But yeah. having a playoff play-in tournament every single year, I don't think that's really necessary. I um, you make a good point there. I'm gonna say like, you know, last year with the bubble, it helped some of those teams that might have gotten thwarted, uh, trying to fight back in. And this year, you got a little less time. You don't have those those last ten games, so the playing tournament gives you a way to make up for that. But when we're back to playing 82 games a season, like 72 is already a lot. But when you go back to playing 82 games, you don't want to go play in a play-in tournament after you've thought you've earned a playoff spot as even just a seventh or eighth seed, because you might not win. But you still get to say you made the playoffs and you, you fought hard to get a good record, get a good enough record to make it there and not just, you you know, you end up in a playoff play-in tournament and you could end up scrambling your luck because you just play 82 games, you're going to be tired. So it's it's does not need to continue and unless, they, you know, everything just happens to be spectacular this season. But there's already a lot of backlash coming to it before it even happens. So I can't really see, you know, a, a good situation where, where they come back. Yeah, and I guarantee you, the Lakers somehow do miss the playoffs in that unreal scenario. That they not doing it again. It's that's not for happen. sure. <laughs> Shannon Sharp will the personally league. make sure that it ends. <laughs> yeah, like the league will be shut down before they ever do that again. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, great, good idea for this year, but do not keep it beyond that. Yeah, I I, I agree. So, that'll be it for this episode, guys. Um, as you can see, we're clearly doing a little bit different format for each episode here. You know, we're kind of just changing the, with the flow. But regardless, we're still going to bring hard-hitting sports content every single week. That is something that won't change. So with that being said, this has been T-Brown 31 with J-Bot the Great. Like, comment, subscribe. As always, we'll see y'all later. <laughs>